son saying, I'm ready to take it on. Dad's hanging on. He won't give me any sense of control. Um, I'm frustrated. I'm 40. I've got nothing but a promise. G'day and welcome to the Farms Vice podcast with your host, Jack Creswell. Whether you farm it, service it, or just love it, this podcast is for you. We'll bring you the techniques and technologies you can implement into your day straight from the leaders and innovators themselves. Spread the Farms Vice so that we can reach more farmers right across Australia. Follow us on all of your socials at Farms Vice and let's get into this episode. In Australian agriculture, people matter. And in an increasingly crowded and challenging world, people reach out for what's real. But you can't fake authenticity. In this episode, we'll be talking to Stuart Weasley, and I think it's a very good one leading into Christmas. Give us a little reminder about our people, what's your culture on farm or in your agribusiness, wherever you may be. So we'll get in deep to this conversation with Stuart and we'll unravel a little bit as we go for next year as well. So enjoy. Right, well, welcome to the Farms Wise podcast, Stuart Wesley, an episode I've been pretty keen to get in the books. We spoke a few months back now, um, but what a day to get this episode done. It's actually Ag Day, if you weren't aware. I wasn't aware, no. So happy National Ag Day as well from those that work within it, um, outside of it, and look look into it as well, as I suppose. It's a pretty big day for Ag and everyone's sort of celebrating or doing their own thing. Um, and hopefully we can pull a little bit of that um, back into the internal workings of what we do. So that consistency of what the podcast is, not only creating awareness on Ag Day, but also for every other day of the year is just as important, if not more important. But welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Jack. Thanks for inviting me. Fantastic. So, Stuart, tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your connection to Ag? What's your role within it? And how did you get there? Yeah, it's a good question because I didn't actually grow up in ag. Um, I don't have any farming background in my family, certainly that I know of, um, but not in my immediate family anyway. But I do come from a, a family business background. And so that family business background has given me a real affinity for what people go through in family business and farming as well. And the connection to farming came um in a in a strange sort of way actually i guess i do have a family connection to farming because my cousin doug fitch was the founder of um ag world that uh, many of your listeners will know and there was a time early in ag world's um, journey that um the wheels were really falling off at a sort of a senior management level in the business lots of conflict uh, between founders and and some of the executives and so I got invited to do some coaching with Doug and then some work with the team to kind of put the pieces back together because it was really threatening to derail their vision. And then at uh, the same time in Oasis, we started getting engaged. Um, we were approached to get involved with sort of in the high wealth, ultra high wealth family space, helping those families uh, with their enterprises and with the family dynamics in particular. So I guess the two worlds overlapped. Um, there was sort of this, for me, this reintroduction to family enterprise through this high wealth work. And then uh, the ag space because of our work with Ag World. And Doug was a real advocate saying, the work you guys are doing with us, I just see this all over the wheat belt here in uh, WA and around the country. This work is needed. So um, some connections were made and some opportunities opened up. And that's it, the role that you are now. So you're working as Oasis People and Culture. Tell us a little bit about, like, what's your strap line? What does it do for the ag community? So we, um, you know, one of the things we, well, more generally, ag, uh, Oasis People and Culture, I mean, I guess our byline is human interaction is a core business process. Yep. And we don't really mind if it's... Um, you know, civil engineering or software or, you know, whatever the business farming, whatever the business, you've got people involved and the key element of people being involved is how they interact together. 
So, you know, a adding family on top of that just adds to the complexity of, and then, and then there's intergenerational stuff in families as well. So it, it's complex around human interaction and, um, you know, and, and dynamics. And so we work across industries in helping build culture and build high performance um, through attention to things like trust, um, relationships, uh, the technology of conversations, in other words, how we have effective conversations, and how we make commitments to each other, how we make decisions together, how we how we even disagree with each other effectively and not kind of want to kill each other in the process is, um, you know, these are really important components of um, not not just family life, but but yeah. business generally, and not usually associated with business, but um, in our view, it's at the heart of it. Absolutely. Yeah. I suppose that was the crux of why I was pretty keen to get you on um, to stop these families going at each other, killing each other. Maybe like a decision doesn't match up um, for that, but how can you actually sort of um, on the other side of that, how can you work with that decision you may not agree with or whatever. And it comes back to culture, doesn't it? And what we sort of do and the approach um, within the people like, Within farming, there's no template of a family, um, two sons, two daughters, mum and dad working harmlessly together. And you can't take that to each family. It's all got to change. Family dynamics change to your neighbours. Um, how does that come into it? And where does culture play a part, I suppose, just to open this episode up? Yeah, where does culture play a part? Well, I mean, culture is, well, one of the things we talk about is you really get a a uh, pretty clear picture of culture as you listen to the conversations that are happening uh, in any enterprise and any in any human system. You listen to the conversations and you'll get a pretty good uh, picture of what's going on in the culture. Yep. I think, you know, picking up one thing you said there, Jack, you know, every family, like talking farming, farming families, every family is different. That, that is for sure. And yet there are also some consistent themes that, um, run through it as well. So, for example, I remember um, I did a road show with um, GRDC uh, a couple of years ago around the WA wheat belt, and I was doing a uh, just a one-hour presentation on trust. What does trust look like between humans and in families? The, and in the three locations, there was a, there was a line of people after that one-hour talk just wanting to talk and the, here's the consistent theme i'm really ready yeah it's a son i'm really maybe it, it's probably not it's it's not always sons but in these situation it was so it was i'm ready son. to take it on dad's hanging on he won't give me any sense of control um i'm frustrated i'm 40 i've got nothing but a promise that well you're going to yeah i'm working for minimum rate wages um, but you know you're going to get the farm this sort of stuff or or there's two brothers and there's conflict between us um you know one one family i worked with i may have gone off your question now anyway uh, one family i worked with um you know it was like the dad wanted to hand the farm over the mum and dad wanted to hand it over but the two sons were such at war with each other that there seemed to be no option other than to sell it. Uh, they didn't have enough scale at that stage to, to split it. And, and so a sale looked like the only option. And this family would then not be farming anymore. And they and, and they wouldn't get back into it. And so we began working with them. And it took a couple of years, over a couple of years, we worked with them regularly you know every couple of months we were talking we were coaching we were helping them learn uh get greater awareness we gave them some frameworks and a couple of years in they signed a five-year partnership agreement um which was such a success and you know and not many of us thought it would actually happen i mean there were times i didn't think it would happen either but um but you know they just they persisted they did so well so you know, the, um, how do we work with culture? It's always different, but there's always similar themes. You know, it's around the intergenerational stuff. It's around how do we manage conflict? It's around 
how do we have hard conversations? It's around how do we um, work with the different pers personalities and the volatility of one and the silence of another. So all this stuff comes into it. It's all got to be, it's all got to sort of be, uh, be worked with. And so we help. That's pretty hard to work with on your own, right? You know, just get family around the table. You can imagine what's going to happen. But when you start giving some skills and then you start facilitating some conversations, some really powerful things can emerge. Not yeah. all plain sailing, though. <laughs> no, and on the other side of that, that was probably a happy decision from both parties, son and the father, going ahead, or was one sort of grumpy going, like, signing off on that um, for it? Oh, in that circumstance I mentioned? Yeah. Um, no, the, um, the, the, the parents were really happy because they wanted their family to keep farming and they wanted their sons to take it on. They just saw the risk was so great that it would just be blown apart. So when these brothers were actually able to come together, and don't forget there was also wives involved as well, so, you know, that, that's part of the system too. Once they saw them come together, they were absolutely thrilled with, that, that's what they wanted to see happen. And uh, it was actually, um, yeah, it's pretty beautiful to watch, actually. Um, it's a know, unique just, position from your position as well, I think. Oh, it's really, really unique. And, you know, sometimes in these situations, you know, again, you know, I use the term the wheels fall off. But, you know, occasionally, more than occasionally, you drive away thinking, oh, my goodness, how is this ever going to work? Yeah. And I find personally you know you, you kind of carry that because here's this family and you and you become you start to kind of really like them and you really want them to do well yeah. and um and then it starts going difficult again and um so it is a unique position jack and it's a real thrill to see it all start to come together yeah so it's probably not as black as white um like culture is not just either negative or positive it's more so probably a sand pit of inner workings. You're building sand castles here and a fort over here, working on different things at the same time. Is that how it plays out? That's actually a really uh, good way of putting it. I haven't hadn't really thought about it that way, but it's certainly a moving feast. You know, you don't you don't go into a situation and say, right, I know exactly what I'm going to do here. You you really listen. You know, there's obviously a toolkit that someone like me would bring in but you're really listening for the concerns and the intricacies of each particular situation. So, yeah, you're right. It could be, you know, the fort could be, hey, we need to do a mediation. There's actually a conflict on the table that we need to help you work through. And the sandcastle might be, yeah, we actually, we actually need to give you some skills around interacting with each other. And another piece might be, Let's do some work on self-awareness, some of the know thyself stuff. And so there's there's different components. And then there might be something really practical like, um, you know, for one one family, I, I just did a simple communications plan. Yep. They, they, and it turned out to just be, yeah, that sounds pretty um, fancy, doesn't it, a communications plan? But it was simply uh, a triangle that was, that said, Hey, let's daily communicate via WhatsApp. Let's do a seasonal um, one-day meeting where we plan for harvest or where we plan for seeding or whatever it is. Yep. And let's do a annual offsite for a couple of days where we do the budgets and set some vision. And and it was that, but none of that had been discussed. None of that was in place. And and so just even practical things like that can really help. 100%. And probably a lot of this is, isn't is really new stuff, but new to the industry and new to the farming families. Like other industries are doing this all the time. Um, it's not as simple as just going to the cafe and everything like that with farming families especially, but prioritising that time um, and actually getting over that first sort of hump as a farming family. How have you seen that roll out? It's always the wives that ring first. Yeah. I, I just, you know, I, I kind of, sometimes I just want to say to the blacks, for goodness sake, just man up, you know, just face it, you know, um, but it's usually the wives and, and they're actually, 
they're offering often suffering because they see the dysfunction and and um and so they ring and and you know when a wife rings i don't have much confidence that anything will emerge out of it sometimes it does but probably more often than not uh, you know the the her husband or sons or whoever they are they won't take it any further um yeah, I'm not sure why that is. I mean, one 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 old bloke said to me, um, Stuart, I don't I don't get what you are doing at all. Like it's just beyond me. He was in his 70s. He's like, it's just, you know, <laughs> it's just right out there. He said, but it seems to be working, so just keep going, you know, just <laughs> so it it is a challenge getting it over the line because people have I'm seeing a family on um, Monday actually. And I was chatting to the dad and I said, I said, mate, the first thing we've got to do is help your son see that I'm not going to lie him on a couch and that I'm just a normal bloke. You know, they're, you know, th this is not uh, like a full psychological, you know, assessment or anything. We're just people giving you some skills to help you navigate the territory. So I think the fear is really, the, the fear of what's going to be exposed can be really hard, but it's kind of un unnecessary. Once people get into it, they think, oh, these guys are just here to help us and um, they're normal. So does that answer the question, uh, Jack? Is it, you know, yeah, can be different. like went off on another sort of realm of what can happen and what does happen. But for yourself, is there many farming businesses out there thinking, you're thinking, shit, this may not actually work for this. Um, and what are the outcomes um, within those farming businesses to turn those, turn a leaf and, get people to sort of change, whether they're coming from traditional, like older people within the industry, both men and women, um, more traditional, maybe they just sort of bullnose this themselves right the way through their careers, their farm, um, to make sure they get through droughts and everything like this. But young people might want to refresh. How has that happened? What sort of negative um, stuff have you seen and how have they sort of flipped that to a positive outcome? Um, so is the question really around the, the distinction between some of the young people's attitude to this sort of work and some of the older people? Is, is that what you're yeah, go, Going on that conflict of we're seeing this big um, transfer of assets coming up and it's dribbling through pretty heavily already. Um, I've just seen on socials and everything like that, my mates um, coming into the end of or going into retirement for the old one, older ones, how... Can we navigate that conflict of interest? If there is conflict of interest, of course, but how can we work with this better? You know, I think that that's a really good question. Let me tackle it from the end of the, you know, the one, the older person that's, say, going into retirement. You know, Jack, one of the big questions is actually not a farming and business question at all. It's actually a life question. And the question is, who am I if I'm not a farmer? And... For many of us, and this is this is beyond farming, this is for many, many people, is that our identity is so tied up in what we do that the thought of not having that identity really can leave us at sea. And, um, and you know, for many people, buying a caravan and starting to drive around the country is just not, you know, yeah, let's do that once for six months, but that's not what the future of my life looks like. And and so I think for for the younger, uh, you know, the next generation, the rising generation, as I like to call them, sort of stepping in, it's recognizing, it's not just, it's it's often or don't presume it's just mum and dad being stubborn or hanging on and that sort of stuff. There's probably some genuine fears about what's life look like now. You know, what, what am I going to do with myself now that I'm not. Um, not farming. And off the back of that, I introduced, I've got a farm yarn segment. We might um, put a seatbelt on you and go through a farm yarn after this episode. But one question, pretty simple, is asking, what are you most fearful of? I haven't done too many or got too many responses, but it's about like what this is. Um, I don't know, everyone's fearful of different stuff. People take it as if like, fearful of falling off my motorbike doing a backflip or something like that but then some people approach it from the farming position of fearful 
of my children um, taking over the farm and I hope their their safety means the most to me. That's a couple, couple of answers I've gotten off the back of that. Um, fearful of like a negative succession plan. Um, people sort of fearful that farming's going to stop within their family and there's no interest from the family or something like that. That's sort of the area that's what people are fearful of out, outside of the other sort of fearful of bloody, I don't know, Canadian bears if I go on travels. Other than yeah. that, yeah. Sort of bringing it back home to what we're working with, fearful of um, not being a farmer anymore. That might be a huge question for retiring um, for this as well. Yeah, fear. Uh, look, I think fears, um, fear drives us a lot as human beings, doesn't it? You know, we're either driven by fear or love, and um, and it's often and it's often um, fear. I, I think fear about what the ne next generation will do is often is is often a big one. You know, um, and there's so in farming in particular, there's almost always there's so much family heritage tied up in it. And there's also the situation where you've got, you know, your business is also your home. It's, it's, it's also you're associated with a town and that's your community. And, and for, you know, if it goes south and you lose it, you actually lose everything. Like you've got to restart everything. And your listeners know this better than me, but that, that generates some real fear, I think, um, as well, because the implications are pretty extreme. Yeah, absolutely. And we're slightly getting to these topics. Like I can't do a million topics overnight. Um, but connecting these sort of topics like yours to biofields, talking about trust and how that can support you, and maybe that can take the fear out of what it is. And then we can work, take that time to work on our people a little bit more and our people as in the family and maybe you're looking at higher and really create some culture with some outsiders coming in and how that fits into your own sort of family dynamic. I think outsiders coming in is a real key. Yeah. Um, and if you just think about it, you know, just think about it genetically. If you don't um, have outsiders into breed, you end up with, um, if it's politically correct, I kind of say, you know, we'll end up with munted kids if we don't get, if we don't get DNA from the outside yeah. coming in. I think um, same thing if in a in a in a family enterprise, if you're only sort of circling around your own system, you're just listening to the same things, you know. So outsiders can bring new ideas and and just help navigate things in different ways. Things will become possible that you've never even thought of. So, um, you know, and trust, uh, you know, trust is actually, we consider trust is the foundation of any, any business or any business relation, any family relationship, in business enterprise, trust sits at the foundation. And we see trust as, you know, if I trust you, Jack, I'm making an assessment about your competence. And that's my assessment about your competence. I'm making an assessment about your reliability for me. I'm also making an assessment about your sincerity. You know, do you mean what you say? You know, can I trust? Is there any hidden agendas? And I'm also making an assessment about what we call your involvement. You know, are you tuned in to what matters to me? If I start to tick all the boxes on those, then there's high levels of trust. But maybe I'm feeling like I can't trust you. But when I think about it, it's actually just reliability. Maybe you, maybe you're just unreliable in terms of finishing things when you say you're going to finish them, and it's diminishing my trust. We can now work on that, but we tend to put it in a big category. You know, the big category of trust, and if that's broken, it feels like an absolute deal breaker. But it might just be one element that we can actually work on. So even just bringing things like that to light for people can go, oh, there's a way forward here. Yeah. Um, there's almost always a way forward. Um, but we don't know what we don't know. And that's true of all of us in in life, you know. It's probably the most, like, being a younger farmer, coming back to the family farm as well, um, 
we don't know what we don't know. So we don't know what other people's goals are probably until it's written down um, on a piece of paper. Maybe you've got completely different ones or you're happily married up and you've got your own sort of goal and you're chasing the same thing. But um, it could be easier if you actually knew what that other person's goal was on farm. Well, you're in business together, right? Yeah. So it's, um, you know, one of the phrases we will use is this notion of, you know, when we're working with families is this notion of together and apart. We actually have to have the capacity to come together, to be together, make decisions together. But we also need to be a part, you know, and, and it's this tension between those two things that we're always navigating. And that that's kind of socially we need to be together and apart. Financially, there needs to be some together and apart and in all sorts of ways. So that, you know, and on that point of, you know, even goals and vision, my assessment is that, um, we don't tend to think far enough ahead. Um, so, you know, we might think about our kids, but what about our grandkids or even great-grandkids? I mean, in the in the ultra-high-wealth family space, they'll be thinking seven generations from now. And there's a, I think there's an, an Indian, a native Indian um, saying, you know, when, I'm, when we make decisions, we want our... Um, we want our children seven generations from now to understand and honour that decision. You know, this the right. sense of having a really long range of thinking. It's not just all about me. And even the question, what's it all for anyway? Like, what are you farming for, Jack? Yeah. You know, and if you make some money, and even if you make a decent amount, what's that for? Um, often we just get caught in the loop of just doing what we're doing and we don't think those bigger questions and they're they're really important it's actually pretty simple but complex to the mind of that hasn't answered a question like that before i think um like you could go farming for 50 years and no one's actually asked that question to you why are you farming um why are like have you asked that question before and gotten a range of different answers I've asked that question. In fact, just recently, I've been I've had two um, two different couples, actually really successful, really successful um, farmers in two different uh, contexts. Never, they had just never thought about the question. Yeah, they thought about what they wanted for their kids, but they'd never really thought about the question of beyond that and what's it all for. So they just keep moving to the next project. The next land acquisition, which is all fine, but you know, after midlife, it's like you've climbed the mountain, you've you've been successful. What what now? These are kind of those existential <laughs> questions that, if humans are, if we're brave enough, we'll ask them, and um, and they they'll take us on a different journey. It may even be a spiritual journey of whatever kind you think, but yeah. you know. Um, they're the sort of questions you start to ask. Um, most people don't ask them. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, everyone now is opening up a little bit more. Um, and the older fathers in both men and women um, actually more adaptable to these questions coming into it. And like the 21st century kids coming into farming are more yeah. likely to ask these questions of themselves, I think, my generation. Um but the older older people within ag are coming up with the answers to these and um, sort of biting their lip sometimes for it as well. But I think that's all part of um, when the time's right, the time's right to sort of open up for each other, for that family. But what I wanted to know was when are people actually um, looking for your services or to improve their people and culture? Um, is it just all, all surrounding succession or is it just on a like, Week to week basis, every week. Um, like how do they engage with us? Yeah, like what time, what period of time? Oh, is okay. the first sort of engagement is it a bit of a last minute panic shit succession? Um, we'd actually like to do this successfully, or is it a bit more? People are starting to come back a bit earlier now. Um. It's a good question. It, there's various ways people engage with us. Like I can think of one family had had a bit of a blow up over harvest. 
So they engaged us. They realised that it was a risk to their business and because they added the next generation in, blow up. Um, wasn't bad, but they realised the risk. And so we worked with them for about six months, once a month. You know, we did these half-day workshops, some coaching with them, basically gave them some frameworks um, to help them shore it up. That was a six-month program. Um, another farming family has lots of conflict. You know, it's the one where they were going to have to sell. That's yep. been, it's been two and a half years we've been working with them and it's been tapering off. So that was really built around succession and conflict and that had all reached a, a stalemate and they just couldn't take it any further. So our role was to get involved and help un unlock that. Um, the most recent ones have, I, I think they've gotten in really early. So they actually haven't actually started formal succession planning, yeah. but they're asking the questions that we help them ask, which are around vision, purpose, values, you know, what do you want? And once they start to answer those, actually the succession part becomes a bit easier because they've got the why questions answered. So our work doesn't, you know, and that was like, Two or three months, I worked with those people just in a series of um, a series of tools, series of coaching sessions, and uh, one of them we ended up with just a, a vision statement and values, and that was enough for them to go and launch properly into their succession planning. So we're not going to do trust structures and financial instruments and a strategy for your business. That sort of, that's not really our space. Our space is helping the humans and get clear about together, be able to talk to each other and get clear about what they want and what their vision is. And it's no point going into succession, I don't think, unless you've answered some of those questions. So a whole variety of different ways um, that, that we would engage with people. What What's probably the main question, the main focus that um, maybe the wife comes to you I want my husband to be talking to his his mum and dad a little bit better. Um, I want to be talking to the mum and dad a bit better, or we all want to be involved within the financials to move this progress a little bit earlier. Um, no. What's the main sort of hiccup everyone's sort of having? Uh, the main the main hiccup is intergenerational. You know, yeah. it's 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 my husband and his sons just can't talk to each other or can't. You know, can't work things through together. You know, they, often they can work together day to day, but when they come to the bigger issues, they're just, they, they have no, um, they don't have strong enough skill set to be able to do that. And, of course, all the family history and, of course, all the power dynamics of being a son versus being a father kick in. So that, that's the biggest question is that wives are worried and concerned because they see they see their families fracturing. I don't want that. Yeah, certainly. And like treading on water here, what, um, how do you go around getting into it all? Um, instead of just saying a complete overhaul from the get go, what's that first question? Or are you asking why are you a farmer? Or if you weren't a farmer, who would you be? Are those the sort of questions you initiate with, or how does that sort of work out? Depends on the context, Jack. You know, if there's, um, you know, if there's conflict and it's all stuck, then you'll you'll actually start working on on that. Let's let's get an understanding of what's going on. Let's give you a few skills. Let's facilitate some conversations and get it unstuck. And then you'll probably do some work, um, you know, helping them relate in effective ways to each other so that so that's more it's more peaceful just at a human level but it also you know drives business success and then you might um, circle back to some of those bigger questions of vision um, but in another situation it might be going really well but they just lost a sense of where they're heading so you start with vision yeah. um, often we will use assessment tools um, you know we have a we have a couple of different um, sort of personality assessment tools we use. One's one's a behavioural one, which helps people identify how they operate, sort of Myers-Briggs disc type stuff. Yeah. And we have another one that goes really deep, which is 
identifying what's motivating me, what uh, what sort of person, what am I taking care of? What's the story, if you like, that I'm living my life out of? And, um, you know, and like for my wife, for my wife, her her key driver is about security. For me, my key driver is about freedom. You can see that we've had some interesting um, challenges in our 33 years of marriage as we've um, navigated um, that sort of thing. And, yeah. Um, you, you know, we just we 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 built a new house recently, and uh, eighteen months ago, and we didn't have a fence around our courtyard, and so people could just see straight in. And she would ask me about this every day, huh. but because I understood this was about security for her, she wasn't just badgering me and nagging about this fence. It actually, it actually made her feel unsafe and insecure. I can actually have empathy and compassion about that. But when I think she's just badgering me, get the fence done, then we're going to be more likely to be in conflict. So understanding what, because I understand what drives her, super helpful um, in, in, in going to the deeper issues rather than just arguing at the level of the positions we take on different issues, if you get what I mean there. So... So that, you know, we will use those sort of tools as well. And they're like a shortcut just to get to know people and for them to get to know themselves and each other a bit better. Very revealing. A fair bit goes into it. And it's a lot to do with probably social cues as well, um, of knowing that your wife was looking for that security at the family home. Um, and you're probably looking for freedom to spread your wings or whatever and what you can do within your own day is your day. Yeah, it's, you know, and it's unique for all of us. Um, so, um, you know, she's, she, yeah, the, the tool we use is called the Enneagram. It's got nine different types. She's not an Enneagram type. She's Carolyn, you know, and so the tools help us get insight into ourselves and others. That's all. Um, you're still just dealing with a person. and But, but when you're realising you're just coming from really different, you're just taking care of really different needs for yourselves. Um, and often we're not even aware of that. Like I wasn't aware of this drive for freedom in me, but now I know it now, you know, known it for over a decade now. Um, I'm like, oh my goodness, I see that showing up in my life in all sorts of different yeah. ways and all sorts of decisions I've made you know, career-wise and oh, all sorts of things that have actually been driven by, I feel trapped, I need to be free. And now I can face that and I don't have to be driven by that need anymore because now I know it. And um, so that anyway, that's some pretty deep, deep type of stuff. Uh, I think yeah. we need to go a fair bit deep, fair, fairly deep on this anyway, just to sort of crack it into listeners out there. But how can someone sort of identify what they are or, what their um, relos are around them um, as a listener. How can we identify how to work with that person better, knowing sort of their inclined personality traits um, to get the job done at the end of the day and their skill set, how we can apply that? Okay, this well, this is a... Um... This is a long-range question, and um, but the simple answer is listen, but recognise that when we listen, we are listening through our own interpretive lens. So, you know, as I listen to my wife telling me that fence needs to go up, I'm listening to it through the lens of freedom. It's like, well, what do we need the fence for? I mean, far out, come on, it's great. We can see everyone. And, you know, I, I'm listening through that. So my ability to recognise the lens I'm listening through, which is all about me, to actually be able to put that aside and just listen to the person and understand the meaning of what they're saying and not feel the need to refute them or tell them they're wrong or correct them or anything like that, but just to listen. And, you know, it's a bit like, Jack, you know, there's an issue. Um, we take positions on the issue. You're like, you know, where Christmas is coming up, where should we have Christmas lunch? You know, there's the issue. My position is at my place. My sister's position is at a restaurant. Yeah. We can argue about that. 
But actually underneath that, these are the reasons why. And we tend to argue with each other at the level of positions. So just listen to what's going on under the hood. And um, that will help a lot. Now, how you do that is pretty difficult because um, we it's hardwired and, you know, we've got decades of <laughs> the same stuff. And uh, so that, that needs some work to sort of get people out of that habitual ways of doing that. But certainly that's a simple answer. Listen. And um, dealing with like people that probably haven't had another job before as well with the baby boomers coming through, there's probably a lot to do with what their lifestyle has been or whatever. And they haven't been open to other other job, other roles, other bosses, or even a boss um, other than their parents coming through as well. As the average sort of younger farmer, I'd imagine their parents would be like that coming through. So also managing that they haven't had that experience, not saying like that's a bad thing at all, but you just have to go about it. I, with our family farm, um, I have to think about that as well. That's that's just provides context, doesn't it? You know, the, the context is that it's, you know, often people have not worked off the farm. They might have been away to boarding school and then come back. That That's sort of a, a nuance of ag is that it's often like that. One of the things more generally in family enterprises is the notion of psychologically it's called the, the process of individuation. Yep. That's really the process of someone going off and making their way in the world. Uh, standing on their own two feet, learning, developing, and then bringing back at some point, bringing back to the family business, whether it be a farm or another sort of business, what they've learned. That that both gives them a sense of I've come back as a full adult and I've also bringing back the learning that I got from my journeys out in the wider world. That That's a really powerful um, process. It's not always possible. Um, because of family needs and, and business situations. But my really strong advice is if, if young people can go off and be away, it sounds like you've done exactly that. Um, yeah, pretty well what I did, but kicked off naturally from the drought and sort of returned to the best season we've ever had. Um, yeah, well, well, well planned. Yeah. Yeah, but that what that would have done for you is... Um, you know, you can speak to what it did for you, but I'm sure it's pretty powerful. Yeah, it's just, I don't know, you'd never sort of know what you what you don't know. Everyone says that all the time, but it's so applicable to what we do. Um, and I think to get off farms, sort of whatever age, and funnily enough, I returned at that average returning age for kids returning to the farm of 28. Um, so it's, I don't know, just sort of, Bit that cliche pretty well but i think it's helping out the farm but also this podcast was my off farm on farm income um to see how i can grow this but also to make the industry impact as well what we're doing here just our, our chat today yeah and that's the leadership that you've you've um somehow you've gotten the vision for to show this sort of leadership in the ag um industry it's um it's fantastic Yes, and I certainly wouldn't have the skills if I didn't go over and work in London to drive what the farm's advice is or even get that confidence because um, we were, I was homeschooled and I wouldn't say I had the best education being like over the radio. We had to say like your name, Jack Creswell, your station, Anna Lara, over and then say what your homework was. Um, I miss the internet coming in um, to School of the Air. So we just yeah. missed it quick sort of teacher interaction and our um our work for the term used to rock up in a box would be, be like christmas each term sort of in a weird way for kids <laughs> opening up their work um but there's a lot of painting and stuff in there to be excited for as well but to see what we did was pretty cool um from that but that's that's going on a bit of a tangent about my upbringing let's bring it back into like what sort of advice you would like um to give to families thinking about succession or even in 10 years we'll look at it maybe they're 20 and then once you're 30 we'll look at it sort of thing or maybe that's not even the situation at all what's your thinking what's your advice on this 
Yeah, I wouldn't like to. Um, I, I wouldn't like to overstate my experience or advice on this, yeah. but from what I've seen so far, is to do it earlier. You know, you, you almost can't do it early enough. You know. Um, well, it can be done straight away, right? Like, not yeah. obviously handing over as soon as you start to work on the farm or she does. Um, but, like, ask what your vision is. What do you want to be in 10, 20 years? I think, you know, and, you know, you'll be talking to your kids even as teenagers and you'll be getting a sense of what they're about, you know, and there'll be some that will be just, like, full. Like, I can think of one um, group where one one of the brothers is like his passion is actually business he happens to be in farming but he could really be in any business whereas the other brother it's all about farming he yeah. just like it was it's almost like even if he was going slowly broke he would still be a farmer because that's his um that, that's where he's, what he's enthusiastic about so i think you know, succession is done early and you're just listening to your kids, um, listening to what, you know, watching what they're enthusiastic about, watching what they've got aptitude for, um, how well do they learn, you know, how well can they learn from you, what's their experience like at school and, and you know, so you can't start early enough. But the other thing I'd say, I was really confronted one day by a um, colleague um, and he he's pretty much a global leader in um, family wealth and um, he's in Hong Kong and we worked together on one particular client and he sent me an article one day and it was really confronting because this article suggested that for most consultants like me, our measure of success when it comes to succession is that the, the business, in this case, the farming enterprise, has been successfully transferred to the next generation. Yep. And what this paper was suggesting was that's a wrong measure. Um, that, that's one, that is good when that can happen. But for some families, actually, the bet the the, the business itself, in this case farms, can actually be toxic to the family. And the best thing to do is just liquidate the assets, split it up and let people go and make their way in the world, you know, and hold together relationally as a family, but with people. And I'm sure you've seen situations where the business is actually like poison to the family. And that's not the sort of outcome I would want, but there's been times I've thought about it um, for um, a couple of clients. I've thought you, there's two I can think of. One's just like, you guys would be best just to sell this thing and move on, you know, but there's so much family history tied up. It's such a difficult thing to do. So it's just caused so much pain. Yeah. What's the point? What's the point if it's causing that much pain and destruction? Um, taking the emotion out of it, people like say and within your decision making now but geez it's hard like we we sold our farm out at Wakenya and that was hard for us as a family like that's not a conflict thing but it was just something we needed to do as a family and just selling it knowing we wouldn't have it again oh possibly but I doubt it um that's a huge thing but then also making that decision to sort of stop farming altogether that would be even harder to come across but in a lot of situations probably well needed until that outside voice says like what you may work with clients Stuart about well yes this is conflicts there um resolution it isn't and for you to just sort of your skill sets or whatever may be more inclined to find yourself out in the world yeah, like, look, I, I don't think you can ever fully remove, emo remove emotion from a situation, yeah. but you do have to, you have to acknowledge the emotion and let it, you know, emotion is like the data. It's like the dashboard on your car. It's giving you data about what's going on under the bonnet. That's what emotion does for us. It shouldn't, we shouldn't let it drive us to decisions, but it certainly informs um, informs decisions. And these are, 
you know, what we're talking about now is incredibly difficult, right? Because when you think about it, you're only asking the question because there's a lot of dysfunction and conflict and pain in the family anyway. And now you're asking the question, well, should we keep going? Well, but hang on a sec. My great-grandfather farmed this land. Yeah. And you can just see, like, that's, that's really that's really charged. So the courage to take that call is massive. Um, but if you can extrapolate it out two or three generations down the track, and this is where we might, you know, we don't, <laughs> it's not my goal to get people to that situation. I'd far rather see them successfully handed over to someone, but helping them create a vision of what life could look like. Because don't forget, if you've always been a farmer, if you've always been on the land, that's your identity. So creating a new one and even imagining you, imagining you, the next generation with a new identity can be pretty hard to do. But there's a process you can go through to start to, um, you know, navigate navigate some of that. Um, but, you know, none of it's easy. Like family dynamics, they're not easy. I mean, you know. Like, I'm really good at this. Yeah. We're really good at this in our family. And we still have these blow-ups and things, you know, around the around the table. Don't don't you? Of course not. No. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, sorry, wrong question. <laughs> um, no, yeah, we're like any other family farm. And if you don't have a blow-up here and there, um, you're probably not contesting the decisions being made, and which is also a good way to steer the direction of the business and everything. Um, if we're all... Yeah. Yes, people, you probably end up worse of um, not really having that direction of what's going on um, or why are we doing this? Are we just saying yes for the sake of it? Thinking that next generation wants to buy that farm, but maybe consolidating is the better answer. Yeah, and there'll be different answers for anyone. And the, the word you raised, they're contesting. If I'm not contesting ideas, then maybe I'm not playing my part. I think where we would come is to say, how do you go about contesting ideas in a way that the other person can listen to and in, and it becomes a really good engagement? Even if it's a bit charged, it's a really good engagement rather than a fracturing experience uh, where people get offended and hurt and, you know, um, they don't want to speak to each other. That that's the that's the challenge because in any in any family in any business enterprise, there's going to be a contest of ideas. Wouldn't it be awesome if our parliament could do this, you know, have a contest of ideas where they're not just smashing each other but actually listening? Anyway, that's a tangent. We won't go down that. Um, I'd rather sit down yeah. on a family farm than the politicians for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, but it's the same thing to be able to contest ideas but do it in a really healthy way. Where, I, where it can be vigorous, but it's also respectful. Um, that's the challenge. Um, a challenge, but also a way to get around improving yourself. Like the, this podcast is a lot to do with personal development as it is building up the farm business and um, establishing that your farm is a business as well goes from that. But we can't do that without looking at the people first. And this was probably a personal development episode rather than um, game busters building your farm up, scaling out or whatever, about looking into that person? Well, you know, you might, yeah, look, I, I probably disagree that in one sense. I mean, I, I get the sentiment of what you're saying there, but if you're scaling, you know, you buy, if you're buying the farm next door, that, that is first of all a human issue. Yeah. That, that goes to desire. It goes to risk goes to opportunity and that all sits within us as human beings we all have different perspectives so it, you know I, I, I do get what you're saying but I would argue that it's not just personal development it's actually deeply about the business yeah and it's probably it's that eventuation into the business isn't it you carry what you are into your farming business I mean you can't not do that can you no you no uh, yeah like we talk about leadership. Leadership is who you are. You know, it's your way of being in the world, you know, and 
it's like when people say leave your emotions at home it's like oh you're right okay i'll just chop my arm off or something you know you can't you can't do that um we are whole people and yeah you're great yeah me you are you so Stuart, from this episode what would what like would be the overarching farms advice piece of farms advice you'd like to listeners to take away from this episode maybe they're struggling maybe they're not but what's that like sort of structural pillar that comes across in each sort of scenario you've ran you know what i want to say to that jack is the value of an outside voice and i say that to myself as well because uh you know like like we have a financial planner because we're not financial wizards. The freedom of having really good financial planners is freedom to us. Uh, and your listeners, they'll, they'll have agronomists, they'll have farm management consultants and that sort of thing. And yeah. I guess I'm making the point in the in the territory of family dynamics and human interaction, which is a core business process, um, we tend to think we should just be able to do that but often we you know that the we know that it doesn't happen well so there is outside advice available and it can make an enormous difference that sounds a bit sales pitchy and i i kind of apologize for that cuz i don't not really mean to be that way but i, I actually no i, I, I just I believe it. it but also i also think the listeners get you as well of what you mean by that getting the outside people in to i don't know look at it in another way but also incorporating and being unbiased towards the two different generations or the two different people in this own scenario um yeah. it's pretty variable we'll be doing it on our own family farm at some stage too to get that sort of flow across and um improve what we do as farmers yeah yeah i, I think i think that would be the there's so much i could say but I think that is the the thing, you know, have the humility. I think it's humility, Jack. Yeah. Have the humility to realise I don't have the answers in all areas. So and that there's no shame in getting support in areas where we're not doing so well. Um, certainly I've been around long enough now, you know, you don't judge anything. You know, people are just people, you know, <laughs> and, and so there's no judgment. It's just, we're just all trying to, we're all trying to just navigate life and and do as well as we can. Beautifully put, and I think that's a great um, time to wrap this episode up. But Stuart, for anyone looking to contact your people and culture services there at Oasis People and Culture, what's the best way to get in touch with you and for that? Oh, they can just jump on our website, uh, oasispc.com com.au and uh, just navigate through to the contacts there and they can um, people can give us a buzz that's the easiest way to do it unreal i'll put that uh your website into the show notes so anyone listening wherever you listen you can have it have a quick look into it what they do and if it can help you even better um but stuart thank you very much for coming on to farms wise podcast great to have a good yarn with you absolute pleasure jack thank you This Farms Advice episode does not stop here. Come and join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, and even join our Facebook group. Go to farmsadvice.com.au for more on this episode and spread the hashtag Farms Advice to your mates. If you can leave a review on Apple or Spotify, that will let other farmers find us too. But until then, see you next Tuesday. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Farmswise podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people today. <laughs>